Free energy, zero point energy, vacuum energy. Today's episode, we're gonna learn what those terms mean. I brought on Ashton Forbes, who you may know from the MH370 videos. To understand what this episode is gonna be about, I thought I'd show a clip from a renowned expert talking about it. What's zero point energy? Zero point energy is a technology that's been around for a long time that's been kind of dark shelved and buried that you could take energy from the vacuum in space to power everything we need. Okay, that was Fred Durst from Limp Biscuit, but he makes a really good point, right? Check out these other clips. The technology to create unlimited clean free energy has existed for over a hundred years. See your, your, um, your tea glass there, that mug. Mm -hmm. The amount of potential energy in the space in that mug is enough energy to boil off all the oceans of the earth. Our engineers are taught to throw away about 10 trillion times for a typical average case as much energy as they pull out of the vacuum without even knowing it in a generator and a battery. So, without further ado, let's welcome Ashton Forbes to Vetted. Enjoy. We've got Ashton in the house. We're gonna be talking free energy. What does that mean? I don't have to pay for energy anymore? I honestly don't know what that means. I probably will get it wrong if I try to describe it. So brought Ashton on. We could talk about what, what this means and how he's involved and what he's got coming up with it. I find it very fascinating and I cannot wait for this conversation. So let's jump in. What's up, Ashton? Hey, Pat. How's it going, man? Awesome, man. So excited to talk about this, dude. Yeah. Um, what, what do I like when I hear free energy? I think. Oh, like I just my electricity bill's gone. Like, what does that mean, free energy, exactly? Yeah, it's a great way to start um, because free energy is a bit of a misnomer, uh, which is why I've been using the term over unity or zero point energy. Uh, okay. Because a lot of people think free energy and they think, oh, well, you know, you're just going to have energy for free. Um, but and yeah. that's kind of true, I guess, but it's more of like, you know, the solar panels also produce free energy, right? I mean, they produce energy and you don't have to do anything, but the solar panels still cost lots of money. I mean, they have, uh, you know, discounts and what have you subsidies, sure. but they still cost a bunch of money. The same is true of, of free energy. So when free energy, we're not talking about, you know, here's energy for free, Although it is similar to the idea of solar panels, it's more of the idea that we can extract energy from our environment all around us. And it's not like wind and solar where it's like we have this wind power and solar power. It's more of like extracting the latent energy that's all around us all the time. So, for example, dark energy is something that we don't really understand, but we know that the universe must have been able to expand faster than the speed of light. I personally believe that there's a connection between dark energy and zero point energy. So zero point energy would say at the lowest rest levels, at like absolute zero, there's still stuff going on. And physics would say that you have these quantum fluctuations in the vacuum that are occurring and that we have these virtual particles popping in and out of existence. Well, what is a virtual particle? Where does that come from? This is why I brought back the idea of the space-time ether, because space isn't an empty vacuum. There is this latent zero-point energy. We know it's there. It's been proven experimentally it exists. The experiment yeah, that proves I have it, heard that okay. about space having, like you're saying, it's not just empty. There's something going on there. And that's, yeah, okay. That's and conventional Sorry, physics, that. you know, going back uh, many years, I mean, there's always been people that have promoted the idea of zero-point energy for decades, but... You know, conventional physics would look back and say that they just they negate it. They say that there's not there's not enough there. So they just zero it out. But the universe is extremely big. So even if there's a very tiny amount, you were to add it up throughout the whole universe, you're going to have this huge amount of energy out there. Now, gotcha. the experiment that proves it is the Casimir effect. Casimir effect is a major player that people should remember, because if you take two plates, uh, I believe the semiconductive plates, put them close mm -hmm. together to one another, very close together there's this attractive force that causes them to, to suck together, which would be a negative energy density that occurs. And then the question is, well, where is that energy for that force coming from? You know, it's yeah. coming from the zero point fluctuations. The explanation is that the wavelengths that are too small to fit between the plates when they're very close together, 
is what's uh, the fact that the wavelengths are larger than the distance between them means they can't fit between. And so then you have this different di differential of the pressure on the outside versus the one what's on the inside. So you Got can imagine it. just conceptually, okay. like if you could tap into that, you know, if you could create something that could utilize that, uh, then you could theoretically get energy from nowhere, from all around us. So that's God. the overall idea. <laughs> wow. If you suspend two uncharged metal plates in a perfect vacuum, you'd expect both plates to stay completely still. In reality, though, the plates would slightly move towards each other. This is the Casimir effect. See, behind the classical view of this example, there's the quantum view. Here, the quantum fields of different fundamental particles are constantly interacting with each other. Although this interplay of fields is complicated to fully understand, the resulting effect is that there are infinitesimally small reactions occurring on the subatomic scale. We call these reactions virtual particles. These particle-like entities pop in and out of existence, barely ever being a part of our reality. However, as they interact with each other, they produce extremely small forces. When taking into account that there's almost an infinite amount of these virtual particles, their combined force becomes quite substantial. And since there's more space on either side of the metal plates than in between them, the virtual particles exert a net force that pushes the plates towards each other. So even in a vacuum, the universe announces itself through the Casimir effect. When did this, or, you know, historically, it may be hard to determine, but historically, like, how long has, have people been, you said decades, like, when did someone yeah. first like think of so, this idea? Do we you know, know? I think if you watched the, the the best video I watched recently, I think you watched it as well. Was the Y Files episode on free energy? Great episode. Yeah, so um, awesome, dude. In that episode, Floyd Sweet uh, was had a little like in the middle of it. You have Thomas Bearden is actually narrating it. Thomas Bearden. You know, I dug into him from the MH370 videos and found out that this guy has been talking about scalar physics and free energy for, you know, 40 years ago. And he passed away a wow. couple of years ago as well. But he was out there with Floyd Sweet looking at this device that was running five 100 watt bulbs and a fan. And it was just this little box that he had yeah. over there. Now, most people try to debunk these types of claims and say that, well, there must be a battery or a hidden wire because people generally can't debunk the devices themselves. Um, and so I would argue that this has been around for maybe over 50 years, maybe as long as going back to Tesla. I mean, even Tesla could okay. have figured it out because in that documentary, and also Patrick Bat David did a documentary as well, and they point out correctly that JP Morgan was the investor in Tesla. And that he yeah. didn't invest in this idea of free energy or over unity because you couldn't put a meter on it. You know, you couldn't sell it to anybody. Correct. Because technically, if you have a device, it's a free energy device, an over unity device. And I just want to clarify the definition of over unity is coefficient or performance greater than one. What that means is that you're you're putting some energy in, but you're getting more energy out than what you're putting into your device. Got it. And that's possible because there's a third input or the second input, an input from the energy all around us, from Got the it. ether, if you want to think of it, from the zero point energy field, et cetera. And sure. then that the interesting part about that is it means that your device doesn't have to be 100% efficient because you have this input coming in and you have this input and these two add up to one another. And even if it's 90% efficient, as long as these two times 90% is greater than one, you're getting over unity, you're getting coefficient of performance greater than one. So- okay. I don't know exactly what kind of device Floyd Sweet used, but if you look back, there's been all kinds of different devices that have claimed to be able to produce over unity. In fact, cold fusion, I believe, is a form of over unity as well. These tokamak, tokamak reactors, they say, oh, for like 30 seconds or a minute, they were able to produce coefficient or performance of greater than one, more energy out than what it took to put into it. I would argue that cold fusion is another form of extracting energy from the zero point energy field. And I think okay. there's multiple ways to pull this off. I think that you might be able to abuse the Casimir effect, which would be something that's probably like um, a device that doesn't have any moving parts. So the Holcomb generator is one example that Dr. Greer has promoted. I checked out their website. It doesn't have like a ton of, you know, specifications, but it does talk about there not being any moving parts within it. In it. So you can imagine. Dr. Greer did a great documentary too, The Lost Century. Oh, yeah, I watched that recently too. 
get that. So there's three that. documentaries people should watch. If people want to know about free energy, because like it's making a research. I'll put the links in the description for that for sure. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I've watched all three of those. And the Patrick yeah. Beck David, I, I know which one you're talking about. I watched that too. You're right. That was, that was And great. he just interviewed Dr. Greer as well recently. And um, I watched, oh, uh, right. not, I don't think I watched the whole thing, but I watched at least like the second half of it, which was yeah. also really good because it talks about zero point energy. I mean, yeah. people have been talking about it openly. Um, and we'll talk here in a minute about the science behind it and how it's possible uh, just to debunk any other rebunk, any other notions that it's, <laughs> it's not possible. Um, and generally sure. what I would say is that when you've had these ideas that have been around for as long as these ideas have been 40, 50, hundred years, like there's most likely something to it. it it's not sure. a situation probably where these people were all just coming up independently with this uh, idea and that they're all wrong. You know, it's kind of like in UFOlogy, they say that, uh, you only need it to be right one time, you know, if you're right one time, then it proves that's that right. it's all possible. And in my that's belief right. is that, you know, the sun could very well be a proof that over unity is possible by itself. You know, um, if the sun itself is, you know, producing more energy out than what's taking in, or you could argue that the reason why the sun can last as long as it is lasting is because it's somehow tapping into the zero point energy field. Uh, we just don't know enough about the sun in general, but, um, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, and I think because I anything that's called fusion could theoretically be producing it. So I don't know for a fact uh, that that's the case, but sure. I would say that there's probably then at least three different ways just off the top of my head that over unity can be produced, which would be cold fusion would be one of them, which is, you know, the power of the sun in the palm of your hand. Um, sure. The idea of abusing the Casimir uh, force and Casimir effect. You know, maybe you make like a coil or something like that, that like, you know, has some type of oscillation or something like that, or I'm not really sure. Maybe there's another way to pull it off. Thomas Bearden had something called the Meg, and there's a 15 minute or 30 minute video where he talks about it. He even goes into detail about why it's not been able to be commercialized or brought public um, and the difficulties and challenges associated with it, which primarily, because a lot of people will say like, if this is real, why have people not been able to produce them? And I would say, first of all, they have been able to produce them. Uh, but there's economic and business limitations. First of all, if you patent it, you may get hit by the Invention Secrecy Act of was it 1952. Yes, I wanted to right. bring that up because that was like, what? Like, yeah, hello. yeah. we just have this like we have this law that's like if you put out anything that like threatens national security, we can just steal your patent. It's eminent domain of in, uh, your ideas, right? It, it, instead yeah. of land, it's like, well, we'll we'll take your ideas. Um, and it's a real thing. 100%. So and, and that's, that's scary. Yeah. And so, you know, they could just take your patent if you try to patent it. Um, they could theoretically kill you or silence you in some other way. But then there's another big limitation. There's actually two other limitations. One is just how do you make it economical? Like, OK, let's say I can make a, a Holcomb generator, but now it costs five hundred thousand dollars. Who, who's going to buy that? Like maybe sure. companies might buy that and, and they might be quiet about it. But individuals, you can't really afford that. You know, and I think that a lot of these devices are like I just looked at like the whole. Well, what's generation. the point of getting that then? How, you know, my bill yeah, for my life is it going to be exactly. five hundred thousand dollars? My electric bill that that would be. So that's the big sense. rub, right? So that's the thing is that there's this economic barrier to entry, which is how do you make it make sense for somebody? Because if it's so expensive that you're not going to make your money back, you know, then it's a problem. Like even solar panels, I think some of them cost upwards of 30000 or more. 100%. That's a great example. And they finance them. And then it's like, okay, well, you're going to save a bunch of money, but you have to do the math and figure it out. The same is true for free energy devices, over unity devices, because it's not going to be free. And then the next barrier to entry, and Thomas Bearden talks about this as well, is that there's only so many people that know how to build them. And these people are generally extremely well compensated already. A lot of them are already working for private military contractors. And so if they're working for those PMCs, that's short for private military contractors. Oh, I like then, that. That's a new term. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The PMC. I like it. I like it too. I'm not big on acronyms <laughs> generally, but there we go. So if you hear me using PMC, that that's it. I love um, it. But they're, they're very well compensated. There's only a few of them. Like uh, from my research into like the MH370 stuff in science, like we're not talking even, we're not even talking thousands of people. I don't even think we're talking hundreds. Like I think we're talking dozens. Oh, and so wow. there's only a few dozen people that can even engineer these devices and they're all already well compensated. Thomas Bearden talks about it's like, how are you going to entice one of these people to make devices for you? They 
you know, and they're already sure. other under these other NDAs and they don't want to risk other stuff as well. So these are the main reasons why it's very difficult to bring these types of things to market. So just to rehash the three main ways that I know of that I believe are all viable are cold fusion, um, then some type of manipulation of the Casimir force, which would be like probably no moving parts, and then the idea of a magnetic motor. So uh, there's been several different versions of magnetic motors that are out there. And I think that a lot of people naturally go, magnetism should have some kind of connection to this, right? Because we can see some pretty cool things with magnetism. And you'll see yeah. a lot of videos on, on social media where they like use magnets to make something, you know, spin or yeah. whatever like that. Sure. Um, and I think that there's there's definitely something there on some of those. But I think that there's a little bit more to it than simply like, you know, getting your, your motor to spin. Because generally, if you do that, if you attach a load to it, it's going to end up slowing down. So the biggest and just full full disclosure, the I started a, a company, EtherTech, which is technically an energy consulting company, um, but we are selling uh, over Unity devices that are magnetic motors. That's about as much detail as I can go into. I did post a video of a magnetic motor that is call it like a, a, a similar version to the version that we're selling that's out there. Um, but so you're going to be selling a free energy device. Technically, I don't, I'm not going to call it free energy oh, because shit. it throws okay. a lot of people wow. off on that front. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and, and the people that I'm working with have already sold many of these behind the scenes and like, they're only doing this because a, like they've seen the attention that I've got from promoting the science that's out there. Um, and then for B it's like, they want to help get this information out there as well. Um, and, sure. and get the devices out there to people so that people can realize that it's possible. Um, and the benefit of this device is that it's probably not as expensive as like a Holcomb generator is, but I think it's probably still more expensive than like solar panels are. So I think that there is, it's not going to be for everybody right away, but like my true hope is that if we can begin to commercialize it, then we can improve the design, get the cost down. And, and it sounds do like rockets, better. like, like what's what, yeah. te, you know, what, what, uh, must did with Tesla, right? Like he realized you got to bring the cost down of these rockets. Right. So I get your point also, here. Like also electric right? cars. I mean, he did it with yeah. electric cars too, right? Like electric right. cars have been batteries. possible forever, but we yeah. only, like when would Tesla even start? Like 10, 15 years ago, it's not even that old of a company. And everybody yeah. was, you know, short selling Tesla and betting against Tesla and all this stuff as well. Um, but yeah. that's, a lot of people would say, well, you just open source it. But if you've been listening to this discussion so far, that's not really how it works because not anybody can just produce these devices out of nowhere. Like, um, you know, you first of all have to have the right design and then you have to be able to tune it correctly. Thomas Bearden talks about this a lot in the Meg video where it's like you can make the right device with the right materials and you will have this extra energy that's being extracted from the environment, but you have to capture it. You have to capture that energy so that it then can be used as coefficient of performance greater than one. One is the that idea I, that this machine would be like something you plug into your house or like, how does this work? Like, yeah, no, great question. So the, the device that we are selling, like technically you need some input to get it going. Uh, and once okay. it starts going, then it starts to produce coefficient performance greater than one. So that could be that you plug it in for a second. And then once the uh, magnetic motor starts going, you unplug it and then it just runs forever. Um, and then there's, but a, then there's how does that power there. your house? Like, yeah. So you can hook it up to your circuit breaker uh, or uh -oh. you can also uh, you can set it up to have like build in a plug into it. So there's like an outlet like AC okay. energy and then you can just plug Got right it. in. Now, of course, the Got limitation it. there would be how much energy it's producing. Right. You can't if you put too much load on it, then you're going to yeah. you're not going to be able to power everything that you that you have. So. Sure. Um, the neat thing is it can be scaled up or down. So right now, the reason why we've just started our alpha rollout stage, um, and we're only looking for a few people initially to get involved in it. We're not really, we're not trying to be famous and we're not trying to be like billionaires off this. We're just trying to get the the devices and the information out there to people. Because Would, would is, this be the first time this has ever happened? No, I think this has probably happened before. And I've been told as well, just through other sources that I have that, 
Um, you know, I, I already just mentioned the people that I work with have already sold like 30 of these devices behind the scenes. They're not the only ones who are doing this either. Other people are selling them behind the scenes as well. And it's probably, I don't know this for a fact, but it's probably like those other private military contractor engineers that the, the people that know that it's possible that are smart. And I think that everybody probably has their own designs. Like I imagine the, the one that we're selling is roughly around coefficient of performance too, which is people would say just completely impossible and incredible. But I think that it goes way higher than that. Like my wouldn't surprise me if you people can make ones that are like coefficient of performance five or 10, which is just insane amounts of energy. Um, Cause you know, that's is that, are you saying that's like 10 times the amount yeah. that's going in? Oh, wow. Yes. And this is what okay. I would say to people is that the people that wow. want to get it figured out and I've, like I signed an NDA with the people that I've been working with because well, the people I, you're building I, this with, you mean, yeah. is that what you mean? Yeah. Got it, yeah. Got the it. people that, I, and I mean, I'm mostly a salesperson, but I'm also somebody who's trying to learn the engineering side at the same time. I mean, I think anybody who's a good sure. businessman should be trying to learn how the, how their products well, work. Well, for good salesmen, you know, your product too, right? Like, of course. Yeah, yeah exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, uh, what, oh yeah. So what I would say is like, I think that for people that want to know, figure out how to do it themselves, what I would say to kind of give people a hint, or at least, and this is just my opinion, not anything related to the NDA is that I wouldn't try to make a device that has no power input at all. A lot of people, when they think of free energy and over unity, they think, well, I want something that has no power input. And that's when they try to get with the magnets and they try to make it so that the wheels spin. I see what you mean. Okay. I get Having it. Power inputs fine. As long as you just get something more to jump out, start it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I because get the it. thing is, too, is like, let's say I'm just going to make up some numbers here. Sure. Let's say it takes 100 watts of power in, but it produces 200 yeah. watts of power out. Coefficient of performance yeah. 2.0. Then you take yeah. 100 power, 100 of the watts that are going out, and you feed it back in to the input. Now, what's That's happening? You're getting 100, 100. excess watts out. Well, or no, whatever. it's not going to duplicate like that. But oh, when double, basically, okay. what it's doing is it's using the 200 out and it's powering itself. Right, because it only takes oh, a hour. I see. Okay. That's how I, I would see. have people think about over unity, and that's also how like cold fusion works as well. Is they say, well, cold fusion takes some power to get the fusion started, but then it's producing more out than it's getting in as well. That's how sure. I would try to approach any free energy uh, device at all. Is that I wouldn't try to make it just like zero input and then output coming out. That's where I think a lot of people get stuck is try to make it where you have some input coming in, but you're getting more out than that. And then- So it's perpetual. It just yeah, exactly. recycles on itself and keeps going. And exactly. And so then people would ask, well, how do you turn it off? And it's actually really simple to turn it off. Is that, so you have that feed and it's going With back- With a hammer, in. sledgehammer, y'all. You just you fucking- smash. No, you smash. just, uh, you you cut off the, the output that's going back into the input. If you, if you Got put it. a switch in there, then it's going to slow down. If it's a motor, it's going to stop. And so you, you just it. have a switch like that. And then it, it'll slow down and then it'll stop. And then if you need to start it back up again, you either just plug it back in again. Or uh, the magnetic motor situations usually do have a battery, but it's not a battery that is like you're not cheating the system. It's that you want to have the energy that you're creating get stored somewhere. Um, sure. And I imagine in the future, like, over unity devices in general as they get better and better they'll always be paired with something like the tesla wall that wall battery and, and other yeah. people have similar products because mm -hmm. you're not always using the exact amount of energy that it's producing and in fact there might be times where like you're sleeping and you're producing like you're using like no energy and sure. you just want the thing to be charging up the battery right and then yeah. in times of need you can use the excess energy that you need. um yeah. That's so a lot of these devices do end up having like a battery associated to them, but it's not the battery that they're, um, it's not like it's a cheating the battery that's, it's running off of type situation. Yeah. You know? Are, are um, you guys going to offer like maintenance for the, yeah. like, as I'm assuming the only thing would be the parts, right? Cause the energy's kind of endless. Yeah, so, but so the parts like itself would be. Like, and I asked a ton of questions before I got oh, I involved you did. in it. And... I bet you did. <laughs> I couldn't find any gaps in any of the logic and anything related to it. And I've also answered a lot of these questions on my live streams. Um, oh, there's my basically bad. no maintenance. No, it's fine. I'm happy to go through the main questions with you guys. Um, but there's basically like no maintenance associated to it. The, the things that people have brought up are, and so like we're so confident that there's so little maintenance that we're willing to give like a warranty on it. The amount of years is yet to be determined. It's probably, especially in the alpha stage, it'll be like person to person, like, 
you know, five, 10 years, something like that. I don't know. Sure. I think we're more yeah. concerned with people tampering with the devices and then claim and then breaking it and claiming that they, they sure. did something to it. But people, hmm. some people ask, well, would the magnets lose their, their magnetic force magnets, like especially powerful ones like Neo magnets, um, they're rated for at least 41 years. And even after 41 okay. years in like the worst case scenario, they may only lose like 30% of their magnetic yeah, field. So in 41 years, I mean, that's more than most people's like adult lifetimes. Um, sure. But it would have already produced so much excess energy that, you know, it, there would be no question in terms of it. Bro, any product that lasts 41 years, yeah. you're happy with. I mean, Jesus, the way things are built now, um, I mean, yeah. let's be real. And if yeah, I'm being real sure. as a business person, you know, uh, which is actually where my original major is and what my, my my real educational background is in. Like, I would probably have it just be like 10 year warranty or lifetime. And yes, it might last for another 15. But like, I would want to have some kind of real practical limitations on it and then have the people do the math based on 10 years. Now, in a perfect Got scenario, it. it could last for 41 you know, it might sure. last for 25, but I want to put something that's like more definite and more a shorter time frame on it for something like that. Um, sure. and, and if then, they modify it, it voids the warranty, right? Because you would imagine exactly. people. Yeah. Are and so they're be... definitely going to be like the contracts that we sign with people are going to have a thing that, you know, you can't tamper with the device. It'll void your warranty, yeah. blah, blah, blah. I mean, that makes and, sense. Yeah. And then the, yeah. one of the big benefits, I, I think I'm okay to say this part is that um, there's, and, may, I don't let's say that I'm 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 giving my opinion here. I don't know if it's 100 percent correct, but let's say that a lot of these magnetic motors, they don't have any belts or anything like that. So one of the big benefits is there's very little stuff that can break down. So a lot of like motor type situations will have a belt, even in your car, and the yeah. belt can break, right? It's gonna wear down yeah. over time, especially if you have mount motors that are spinning. But yeah. um, or I don't know how to do it, but yeah, so but the motors in this situation, <laughs> um you know, because they don't have any like belts or anything potentially tied to them, there's very little stuff to very little friction that's happening there. You know, maybe the worst case scenario, and I'm just speculating, would be like maybe you have to put like a little drop of oil or something on it if it's, sure. you know, the, the wheel isn't as connected to the thing. And that's part of why Dr. Greer also, though, talks about like devices with no moving parts, because no moving parts means like, you know, it's going to have basically no maintenance. But minimal moving yeah. parts is also going to have very little maintenance. So sure. from a maintenance perspective, I, I think there's very little issue with it. To me, the biggest issue is having it produce enough energy to run your whole house. Because, I, you know, how big does the device have to be? How costly is it going to get? How much energy are you using? I think that a lot of people don't realize uh, that, or they just don't know how much energy you're using. I don't know how much energy I'm using. And for those Would people, you hook it up I, at your house? Should that um, be the first test? You hook one up at your house, man. Yeah, I, I don't want to go too much into my living situation, but let's just say it's not well, super practical for yeah, me based on my living situation to do it. But Got it. Got it. what I will say is that um, it is possible that I will have one uh, handy here um, in some time in the near future. And if I do, yeah. then I probably will talk about it a little bit. I've, I've kind of avoided talking about some of the stuff of the business because I, I, you probably haven't noticed, but... All of the same haters that I had from MH370 have all now just shifted to hating on the free energy oh, stuff. Bro. Uh, no no matter is, what you do, they're going to come after you. Because it's not—it was like, never it, about MH370, right? It was always about just coming after me, uh, and that's yeah. you know just goes to yeah. show what it's about. Which there's probably some in in the chat right now as well, but I just call them my fans in general. Um, but I would ask people. This to, is my chat, and they're probably talking about me right now. So, like, your chat is actually pretty it. awesome, man. I, I do have to be honest. I've I've checked out some of your stuff, and a lot of you guys uh, are are really awesome. You've been doing. By the way, you've just been That's doing a great true. job, man. I mean, no, thanks, I, Asher. Have you even missed a day yet on these? No, dude. I, I, yeah, I, I, you've I been have, consistency is amazing, man. Like that is you are solid. I and I'm glad you're doing this uh, talking about free energy, and I'm glad you had me on to talk about it because. I do really do think that it's a thing where I, I just want the world to have it because I think that like wind and solar are just a big scam. Um, and I mean that just kind of tongue in cheek. I mean, of course, if you live off the grid, don't get me started. I, I, I think it's a scam too, dude. So don't yeah. get me started. I'm I'm with you there. Like I could go off on that if you if, like, if I'm being real. Wind power kills a bunch of birds. Solar yes, power I'm stuff. With you. Like people don't realize Dude, solar the piping like that they've got to lay the cables out outside yeah. the city. 
it's killing animals. Bur I'm with you, dude. I could go off. I'm with yeah, you. I, I, you. I'm not a fan of it. If you looked at the lithium mines that they have for like the uh, solar panels, it's like green toxic sludge. You're like, dude, that's got to be the crazy. worst stuff for the environment. And people say, oh, Absolutely. the solar panels are technically recyclable. Uh, I don't think that they really are. Generally, like only like one in 10 solar panels being recycled and it's not cost benefit. There's no cost benefit to it. Most of the stuff, the solar panels is like they get destroyed. And they just get thrown in the dump. And now we've got more yeah. trash. So comparatively, a free energy device that can run for 10, 25, 41 years or more, you know, that is far less when it comes to damaging the environment. That's a way where we can like have sure. real green power. And people say, well, where's yeah. the energy coming from? Well, the energy is coming from all around us. But um, the best way to think about it, and I think... Um, I think it was Richard Feynman first quoted this, but you'll hear people, you'll hear Dr. Greer talk about it, Hal Pudoff talk about it, is that there's enough energy. I'll just use this bottle here, although you don't even need a bottle this big, but there's enough yeah. energy in this entire bottle here, if this was full of water, to vaporize all the Earth's oceans. And when you think about it like that, like E equals oh, MC shit. squared, like how much energy you can produce from a very small thing. Now imagine we only need a little bit of energy from you know, the environment to be able to power everything around us. And the truth is, even though we may have a lot of devices in our home, that energy in relation to the size of the universe is infinitesimally small. So even with these okay. types of over unity devices, extracting energy from the environment, it's like taking a little teaspoon and, and, and pulling water out of the ocean and thinking that you're going to drain the ocean, right? It's just yeah. literally impossible. It's never going to happen. Sure. Sure. Um, I see what you're saying. You're not going to pull all the power that's around here, right? So, like, yeah, I think we would idea, have to yeah. be like a type three civilization before we get to the point where we have to start worrying about how much energy we're pulling from the environment to have any appreciable effect. Although that might sure. be something we worry about in a thousand years or whenever we achieve that. So for the power sure. levels that we're using, you know, like these types of devices, I, I think there's basically no risk. It's not going to give you cancer or anything like that. It's not going to lift off the ground and take off. Although there does seem to be some connection between this idea of free energy and anti-gravity, um, uh, which I think is interesting. But the, the amount of energy, the devices that we're talking about producing, it's too small to have any type of major effect like that. How big is these machines? Like, what are we talking? Like, refrigerator size or? Volcom one is like refrigerator size. The one that we're selling is like, um, and, and it's motor, you know, a magnetic motor type situation and setup. So, the what we've been telling people is may, maybe like three by three feet. So it's like a, a square, like a generator oh, shit. type size. Okay, yeah, and yeah. You know, a couple pieces yeah. to it, so it's, yeah. um, and you know, it can be boxed up or, or what have you as well. It can be EMP shielded. Um, but generally, I would recommend people have stored inside out of the elements, like, you know, in their basement or in a closet somewhere where it's not going to be in the way. It makes a little bit of sure. noise, but it's pretty damn quiet. I mean, just because imagine spinning wheels. Um, so, yeah, not, not too large wow. in general. Um, but I, I imagine, too, that they can be miniaturized. One business idea I have for it is if we could get very small uh, magnets that are very powerful, potentially you can make. Uh, like some kind of portable charger that's like just a free energy charger. Cause I saw people that had these when I was at the cosmic summit, but it's like solar. So you can like charge this battery from like a solar panel and then you can like, you know, plug your USB to plug your phone into it. Imagine having a little device like that, but that's just extracting energy from the environment all the time. So you just have a portable charger everywhere you go like that. That's always awesome charging. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Right. Uh, yeah. That's is, very like, cool. I don't know if we can get it like, cause even if it was, only producing a little bit of excess energy as long as there's like a little battery connected to it that it's charging up all the time like that could be awesome so Dude, and then if you can get it maybe that can be cheap enough where like that's just like a different type of product as opposed to one that's just powering you know your whole house well yeah uh, that's a more so, mainstream one right to sell yeah. right it seems like um ha have you talked about price of this publicly i don't want to bring it up yeah and i like, you know i kind of got attacked for it but i you know what I, i've always tried to be transparent about it so like the price range is wildly so it can be anywhere from like f as low as potentially five to ten thousand dollars all the way up over a hundred thousand dollars um for these devices sure. because it can be scaled up or down now, if you have right. a device that's on the lower end, you're really talking about something that's just going to be able to charge like your phone and stuff like that. If you're looking for something that's like going to power a house, 
then you're looking at you know the probably the midpoint or above. But the way that we have it set right now is we don't have specific products. Like this is the model that we're selling at a specific price sure. point. Um, although that's information that we are trying to glean from this alpha rollout where we get a few people on board with contracts related to it. But for now, it's built custom to spec and they can be scaled up or down. Um, so it, and one of the main questions that we asked uh, was how much power are you trying to generate from it? Because then we have to figure out exactly how big the device has to be. OK, I see. So, so this like, is wait, what problem. are you going to use this for? Yeah, right, and there's a whole list of questions. Like, it's probably on my Twitter page. Uh, it might not be pinned there anymore, but there was a big list of questions. Where people can go find more information, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, and they can find cool. the email address. I mean, I'll just say it right now. Uh, the company's name is EtherTech, A-E-T-H-E-R-T-E-C-H. And the email is EtherTechLLC at gmail.com. I am responding to some of those emails and collecting more information, but the main information is like, you know, tell us your contact information or, you know, as much as you feel comfortable telling us, um, you know, how much energy you're trying to produce and then what your use of the device is going to be. Um, and there is some possibility that, you know, if you're trying to learn about it, we, we're still open to that idea. Um, yeah. But, you know, there, we're also offering consulting services for if you want to try to do it yourself and learn how it can work. So, you know, whatever people want to learn and do. But um, right now, I think it's it's more of a casual thing because we understand, like, the suppression history around all of this. And, Dude, of course, you know, this, could, this could get taken away at any moment, you know, in terms of like somebody stepping in or, you know, sending some kind of uh, thing that says, hey, you, you, we need you to stop doing this from the government or something like that. So uh, uh, yeah. we're just being very tentative uh, at the moment and just trying yeah. to make sure that you know, we can actually get these devices out there to people in general. So, uh, and then course, you know, we'll dude. see what happens. And I honestly, I, I approve of like anybody selling their own devices and, and trying to turn this into an industry. That's what in a perfect world, I'd, I'd like there to be competition industry. Of course. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah. may the best person win who can, who can figure it out uh, and have it be the most efficient and cheapest. Cause then we can, you know, help, help fix this world up a little bit. And that's the reason why I'm in this is that, you know, truth is I only found out about this science from the MH370 videos, from following the scientists and engineers and going down this uh, trail of the science and technology. Um, and then I've been put in touch with contacts that I never would have thought I would have met my whole life after all this. Um, and so it just seemed like the logical way where, you know, there, I, there can be some benefit from this science, even if like people think that image through some zero videos are fake, even if we never get answers from the government, even if the AARO never responds to me, which they're still ghosting me. It's been almost three months and they haven't wow. emailed me back since that last. I don't know if you saw it on, on Twitter, but yeah, I, I, I remember yeah. that. In fact, well, you, we spoke about it briefly the last oh, time you were yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, briefly. Um, yeah, they hadn't responded to you. It's weird. Um, yeah, it is weird. Um, so, you know, yeah. if we can get free energy to the world, that's a, that's a benefit. And I think that those videos can only be real if free energy is real as well. Um, so let me talk real quick about the, some of the scientific aspects to this so that people sure. can understand how it's possible. Um, so with a system like I was describing, where you have one input here, or let's say input over here, just to be consistent with before, you have this output over here, and then you have a second input over here, which is the ether, the zero point energy input. This is a non-equilibrium system. So an equilibrium system would be like a conventional system, let's say wind power, where your input power is the wind that's coming in over here, and then you have your yeah. output power here. That would be equilibrium system. Equilibrium system can never be 100% efficient according to the second law of thermodynamics because there's always some entropy. Entropy is the heat that's right. being given yeah, off yeah. because you know the windmill is moving. It can never be 100% efficient. Same with sure. solar panels, same deal with that. In a yeah. non-equilibrium system, you can achieve more than 100% efficiency because you have that excess input that's coming into it. Therefore, it's non-equilibrium anymore. So you've got this input and you've got this input coming in over here. This is also what's a the negative. Input? What's yeah. the input That, that in? input like, is, is the input doing? from the zero-point energy field in general. I guess that's the 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 secret sauce here, right? That you can't really yeah, talk about. I mean, that makes sense. So that makes sense. That, Look, that, that's, I get it. The Casimir force though, could be it. For example, the, however cold fusion works could be it. Or in the case of the magnetic motor, uh, what I can say is that it has to do with essentially like how you've aligned the magnets. And if from the Thomas Bearden video of the Meg, he specifically talks about taking like a, 
not necessarily a toroid, but like a square shape, um, probably a electromagnet type situation. And when the magnetic field is confined within the actual structure, then you have this energy that's being radiated all around it. And this is excess energy. And then it's simply a matter of being able to harness that energy. Capture um, it somehow, right? Yeah. yeah, capture it. And so how you capture it is potentially the secret sauce for how you can actually produce a solar unity. But if you can then capture it, now you have a negative entropy system, which your negative entropy system is saying instead of losing energy due to heat, you're getting excess energy in from the environment, which what it does is it cools down then in that situation. And this is why a lot of these free energy devices, they, they say that not only sometimes do they lose mass, uh, but they also cool down because they're negative entropy systems. They're getting excess energy in instead of the excess energy going, coming out in form of heat. And this yeah. is how you can then achieve coefficient of performance greater than one and what people would consider to be efficiencies that are greater than uh, 1.0. Um, and this is the part that people struggle with because they think that it violates the laws of thermodynamics. But it doesn't because what you do is you just open your system up. So again, a equilibrium system is going to be a closed system. A non-equilibrium system is going to be an open system that is now open to the environment, open to all the energy that's around us all the time. And then in order to understand that that's possible, you just go back to the beginning of this conversation and just realize that space is not empty. And if space is not empty and the Casimir force exists, we know there's excess energy that's out there. We know there's free energy to be had. We just have to figure out how to harness it. And just because the Casimir force exists doesn't mean that the Casimir force is the only way to extract the zero point energy. It's just scientific evidentiary support, uh, proof that it is uh, that that energy exists out there. So do you, um, do you think like um, the environment in which this is operating might affect it or altitude or a good I question. don't know, right? Different things. Um, generally it doesn't matter. It can produce, it, you don't want to have it in like freezing environments just because it's got moving okay. parts and things like that. Um, I mean, sure. but, that makes sense. you know, in general, it, it's not going to make any difference if it's cold or it's hot. It's not a matter of the temperature having an impact on it in general. Um, just because the zero point energy field is all around there all the time. There may be some efficiency change though, based on the temperature. I probably have to ask about that just to be sure. I'm not, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, sure. Uh, but I don't think like being in the mountains or altitude is going to have any impact on it. It's not a situation where gravity is having a, an impact. Plus, even so, the even if you were like high in the mountains of Mount Everest, the percentage change from the altitude is so minimal compared to how the devices are operating. I, I don't see there being any impact on the, and like any Earth's mag or magnetism or anything. Doesn't. Yeah, I would be more concerned like if you take it into outer space, maybe then there's a <laughs> there's an impact. But even then, oh, I think probably, some of these devices can probably still work just fine in outer space. No Dude. problem. That's how we should be um, operating these spaceships, right? Using the energy around as it travels. Maybe that's what and probably these... some other stuff, too, that I. I had to have somebody else edit out something else I said about it. But let's just say, imagine all the different types of vessels and the various mediums that exist. And, you know, you could see how a, a, some type of zero point energy device could be very beneficial in a lot of different scenarios for a space shuttle. I mean, for sure. Satellite could be beneficial. Um, yep. Yeah. And I won't speculate on uh, Cars. Um, yeah, I could go uh, kitchen. I could imagine a kitchen, you know, my chef brain going a kitchen powered by this, like some sort of different technique. Honestly, chefs would start figuring out a way to make a dish off zero point energy and sell this like great Wagyu cut, you know, zero point energy cooked. Like I, I could already see the, uh, which would be cool. Um, you know, chefs are all about get, coming up with some crazy uh, new energy form, right? Because that's all cooking is, is energy. And pro, you know, some sort of ingredient, right? Mixing it in, right? right? When I, I remember I'd ask somebody, uh, my other podcast, well, what's your favorite thing to cook? And they go, salads. I go, that's not cooking. Making yeah. a salad is not cooking. You need heat <laughs> to cook. So anyway, um, yeah, dude, this is fascinating, man. I, I have to admit, this is fascinating. And I do want to say something real quick that, sure. that sort of endorses what you're saying, which is there are, for anyone listening, there are other examples of other attempts at this sort of convergence you're talking about right where where there's more output than input being from this y files episode that i found interesting because real proof of this happening right which is this guy 
you know, with gas, right? And he and he made this his car go like 200 miles on two gallons, and he had built this system. Stanley Meyer, I think. I think that is his name. Is that the and water what happened? Car? Is that the one you're talking about? No, no, before oh, okay. that. But that guy too, right? And all these people that he mentioned in, yeah. in the Waffles episode that AJ mentions, and then what happens? The Air Force gets interested, and then yeah. boom, it's gone. It disappears. So the idea that let's be real if this was real and this is happening and ashton you're looking into it and make in developing a company off of it i wouldn't imagine you would do that put all this work into it if you didn't think there was something there so oh, yeah. there is there is evidence in the past of these types of technologies surfacing up bubbling up and then you know disappearing if you will through through many other you know modes right however it may be financially they ruin you your reputation um you know your life um it's true and and this idea of, of free energy or zero point energy it's crazy um that 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 has happened because right it's like whoa what what all from money all because yeah. they couldn't make money off it and the light bulb's another great example Right, the light bulb was meant to last a hundred years, and they were like, "Wait a second. Supposedly, they can make them last uh, forever. And yeah, and they were like, "That's not going to work. How are we going to sell light bulbs?" They do it with cameras too. Like cameras don't release all their newest technology in a camera because oh, yeah. then you would buy a camera every twenty years. Instead, they little bits they throw out at you every year, so you keep upgrading like everything. Same with iPhones, right? right? Every year. Same with iPhones. One. Yeah, man, they're not giving it to everything that they can do so i find this fascinating man what what does the timeline look like for yeah, i'm sure really it may rush, be up but, in the air, so, but... like I, actually right after this i'm going to respond to some more emails i've had over like 150 um and i've that was oh, after shit. all the spam ones were removed so there's a yeah. lot of interest in it it's a matter yeah. of finding the right people that have the disposable income for it that are comfortable with the idea and what I would say to anybody who's a detractor, first of all, like you said, the thing, like they have a million different ways that they can shut you down, which is why I'm very realistic about, I don't know how long this might last, but we're just going to run with it as long as we can. And hopefully it works sure. out. Um, sure. But, you know, I, there and like there's so much so many people who are attacking me and, and defaming me and what have you online related to this. It's super suspicious because it's kind of like the MH370 thing, too, where it's like. Don't, wouldn't you want this to be real? Because it can just change like the whole world. And so it, it, let's just say hypothetically, I was I was scamming people. I'm not, but let's just say I was. Like I would I would get sued by the people that I'm selling the devices to, right? Like so, why would you even worry about it? The only reason to be trying to attack me related to it is that you're insecure in your worldview because. You know, you think that if it turns out that I'm right, then it's going to mean that maybe I was right about MH370. Maybe you've been wrong about it and then lied to your whole lives. Like, that's the only reason in my mind when anyone would even be against this. Otherwise, even the people that are against yeah. me and hate me should be like, yeah, go ahead and do it because it's doomed to fail. If you think it's not possible, it should be doomed to fail. Right. But that's not really yeah. how the people act in general. So uh, what I would say is, just, you know, let it play out. And, and then I guess we'll see one way or another. And if I'm right, then. You know, I'm going to help bring free energy to the world. And, you know, then people that also maybe are like worried about me or whatever, like, don't worry about me in general. Like, I, I know oh, what I consequences see. can happen, you know, because some people yeah. are like, you're going to get disappeared. <laughs> I'll see a lot of people I get that message a lot. I'm like, guys, Damn. I'm already even revealing like what I think is the biggest conspiracy of all time related to anti gravity tech and stealing a Boeing 777. So, you know, I'm already you made like, it through that you know yeah already, yeah already yeah even in this year so <laughs> That's uh, but i will say i did say i put out this video the other day where like i am pulling back a little bit on some of the science review stuff and the reason is that like i think i'm so over the target that i, I am like maybe pushing it a little bit like you know i've seen what happened to these boeing whistleblowers and yes i'm a brave guy but like i, I want to be around long enough to like help people a little bit as well yeah. so yeah um you know, so if I'm not pushing as hard as I was before and like, you know, just straight up calling out President Obama like I was before, these are parts <laughs> of the reasons why it's like it's this is a this is a long marathon. This is not like some sprint that we're trying to get this stuff out there. Um, sure. So and then the last I just want to appreciate you and uh, everybody who's been supportive of it, because there's a lot of people out there that know this stuff is real and know it's possible, especially around the free energy stuff. 
dude, and, a lot of people talk about this. I don't get the idea of attacking you about it. Like, it's crazy. It's like, dude, right. d- 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 like Ashton invented that. Like, what are we talking about here? A lo- tons of people are talking about it. Reputable people, yourself included. There's a history to it. Like, what are we talking about? It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. And there's a bunch of people too. So if you're somebody who's like, oh, you have to open source it because Dr. Greer said in the last century, you have to open source it. Well, there's people that have done that too. So why hasn't it got out? You know, because it's not as simple as that, right? We talked That's about some of those point. big issues. So, yeah. you know, I'm doing it the way that I think it can work maybe. And I think that everybody else should do it. I support everybody who's getting free energy out there. I'll be happy if anybody can make free energy become a real thing where like the world has to accept it. That that's Crazy. all I basically want. I I, I yeah. want everybody to try their own different path because the more different paths we try, that you know maybe one of them will work out and we'll end up getting this. Because it's a great point. You know, truth is, Pat. Like, and I think you agree with me. I want to live long enough to see Star Trek world. You know, where we have Dude, like hundred percent crazy technology. I, like, of course. And, and that's why I think you're interested in like some of the UFO stuff too, is because there's something potentially there, and if so, it's going to change right. everything about our whole civilization. And I don't yeah. want to die and have missed out on this because I look at people like Thomas Bearden, uh, Bob Baker, who this guy had all these high frequency gravitational wave patents, even going back to people like Tesla and some of these other brilliant minds, like they never got to see the fruits of their labors, you know, and right. I don't want that to happen with me. And for the people that are out there, and I know there's engineers that are out there right now that are like older and some of them probably want some of this stuff out, like. I want those people to live long enough to know that like we're going to make it happen man we're we're going to make it happen it's not going to be right away but maybe hopefully in the next 10 years 25 years we can we can make it dude you're trying what what more do we want from people like you're putting your effort time money into this I mean, you guys have to invest money just to get this going. If anyone knows that's ever run a business before, I have lots of them. You 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 invest a lot before you ever start making anything back. And it's, it's a risk. Yeah, um, so, risk. dude, anyone putting boots on the ground to do something physical, investigate, like, I just, I'm so blown away by the pushback on that. Um, it, it blows my mind. And, and like you said, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Like, you you know, you're going for it. Like, dude, I'm all about it. I, I 100% support um, you going for this. I think it's awesome. Um, you know, if there's, if this works out like, hell yeah, that's like crazy. And again, I be, I'll be honest, like this has the most promise to me than a lot of things I've heard. This idea of this free energy, the way you've put it, right? Like that idea, it just, it really has a lot of promise like there's you know what i mean um but i mean definitely physics already like knows like like i said before this is the crazy part it's like physics agrees yeah. there's zero point energy that's out there that there's these quantum fluctuations yeah they just they can't explain where the virtual particles come from but they know it's Correct. there so it's yeah. like that's the craziest part about me is like if you're a dreamer if you're somebody who just imagines what's possible then you realize it has to be possible that we can get free energy. It has to be possible. It's just a matter of like, how do you Figuring engineer it, out. it correctly? Yeah, exactly. Figuring it out. And so that's what's so wild about some of these people that are out there. Uh, and honestly, you know, I'm just going to throw a little bit more shade at Reddit. I don't, I don't know. You're not probably not a fan of it, but this is why I, mean, I love Reddit. What are you talking about? They love me on Reddit. Yeah, they love you. What, are you, what are you talking about? I'm the Reddit king, you, bro. <laughs> um, Cause like I, it's not just, there's several different subreddits I've seen even put predating the MH370 stuff. Like there's one on EM drives. There's one on, uh, I think there's probably some stuff that we talk about over unity. And every time you have these egotistical assholes and they always say, this isn't possible because I wasn't taught this in school, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right. Like every time you see these same comments over and over again. Yeah. And I just look at it and I go, what is wrong with these people? Like, we know that the physics is possible. We just need to figure out how to make it work, you know? And that's where I wish people were more open-minded. And I think that part of why Reddit and social media in general are just the worst is because it becomes this game of one-upping one another to be the most 100%. skeptical and to be the most uh, like negative person out there. Like, you know, and, and it's like you're trying to get praised for trying to put somebody else down. And that's why I don't like that social media platform, at least on Twitter and X, for example, like everybody has their own voice. So people can gravitate towards people that they appreciate. So what I would say for the people that are out there is you should open up your mind a little bit 
and let's try to make social media a little bit better because I think that it really holds back a lot of these scientific progress and advancements when we think inside this box of this is only what's possible, uh, nothing else beyond what I know and what I was taught. It can be it can be real. I mean, I can't argue that, man. I mean, that that's like science 101, right? And and you know what? Speaking of Terrence Howard, Eric oh, yeah. Weinstein, they they did that interview on Joe Rogan. Did you see that? I mean, yeah, I, was like four I, I reviewed and a half the first hours, half but... of it yesterday, but yeah, it was like four hours. So <laughs> I only crazy. got through like the first half. I'm not sure I'm even yeah. getting through the second half tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, Honestly, the last well, 20 minutes are the best part. Oh, is it? Damn. See, uh, the first uh, like 45 minutes is like, I, I don't like a lot of the numerology math, like one times one equals two stuff. I'm yeah. not big on that. Totally. And they talked about it for like a while, but they did oh, have yeah. some pretty good stuff where, um, and honestly, Eric, uh, Weinstein had some good points as well. Two of the, the I points that, I, like, yeah, he, the Aaron Hoff Bohm effect stuff was really good because so he points out that, like, even if in the absence of electromagnetic fields, you'll still see light bend. So the question is, like, why is it still bending when there's no electromagnetic fields manipulating it? There's something going on. And this is where he says yeah. there like, must be curvature at these, like, small micro, uh, you know, quantum scales that are going on sure the other thing sure. and this is just a, a message to the people that are out there um he says like don't hit on on 19 he tells uh terrence howard that part i don't know if you remember that where <laughs> the reason why that's a big one is that it's like when you have 19 your hand is good enough and, the, and what this means is that like a lot of people out there especially in the ufo conspiracy worlds they're trying to find the answer to everything that unifies everything together like consciousness, right. anti-gravity, free energy, uh, you know, the old sacred teachings and lost civilizations. They want everything to be connected together, which, you know, to some degree, maybe it is. But when you do sure. that, the reason why he tells Terrence Howard that is that you open yourself up to fall into a landmine where now you're going to find something where they'll be able to discredit you really easily. And maybe I deserve Good some point. of this criticism because I'm you know, talking about free energy now after talking about <laughs> teleportation and anti-gravity. Uh, but this is why, like, I don't go too far into the uh, the sacred geometry stuff, and like, I I try to stay in my lanes as much as I can. Sure. And that's what I would tell people that are out there too: is that not every conspiracy is necessarily connected together. Although for UFOs to exist, there's got to be a pretty major one going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I thought it, uh, Weinstein has some good points. So I, I want to listen to stuff oh, yeah. about scalar physics and the second half later tonight. You know, for me. Um... Look, I'll be honest, a lot of it was over my head. OK, I didn't pretend to know a lot of the things they were talking about. But what I found most fascinating and what I took away from it was really the end. Right. When when for me, anyway, when Brent Weinstein, they take a bathroom break. That's how that's how you know where it starts to clip it, it, what I'm talking about. Anyway, he comes back and they basically start talking about, look, academics, because this goes back to my science 101 thing, right? the point you made before that, like. We, it's like academics and science has forgotten to sort of be open to ideas and discussing them and going over them and right having this sort of and that's what he appreciated about Terrence and yeah. what he was trying to do and um, you know he just made this great speech about just like we need to be having these discussions going over this stuff but being able to call bullshit too but being able to look at this go that's interesting and this and that but the idea of just let's not shut all this down and just is that peer reviewed is this that is this this is that you know like get crazy with it or get personal and you know hey let's let's be able to talk about this and people can learn and sometimes you learn from by making mistakes let's be real you learn the most by making mistakes right oh, in life right. um right anthony bourdain i always bring everything back to food anthony oh, bourdain was, had a great he quote great, I miss him. is he yeah, he's oh god a hero of mine dude like you, in order to get to the best meal, you've got to go through a few bad ones. It's that yeah. simple, right? Because you've got to be open to eating too, right? It's like, go try this place, go try this meal, try this ingredient, try this exactly. thing to get to something you may never know is going to be good or, you know, take you to that um, umami, we call it flavor, where it's just like, it brings everything together. That's yeah. what umami means. It's just like perfect, like the, like just the perfectness. And I feel that way about a lot of this stuff, even though I don't understand it. Um, the idea that we can't discuss it or people can't try to bring it to fruition. Hello. 
Like I, that's one oh one. Like, of course we should be there and then go from there. But the idea that we would just shut that down at the beginning, I, I just, it makes zero sense to me. So, yeah. And like, I, you know, that was a great quote, by the way, Anthony Bourdain, also one of my heroes, uh, you know, rest in peace, that guy. Um, yeah. But one oh, of the, geez. somebody else that I want to quote is kind of a similar vein. I posted this video yesterday from uh, Carl Sagan and his last interview he did in like 1996. So we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which no one understands anything about science and technology. And I, I think that's such a great quote, right? And not to put it you is. down because you just mentioned, like, I don't no, understand this stuff, but you're open-minded. But it's true. About it, right? It's true. It's true. Like, you know, oh, yeah. even this iPhone. I don't, like, how, how does this I don't understand I how my <laughs> mouse works, bro. <laughs> I, I, yeah, dog. Right? I, my mic, the cable, the fucking, yeah. the video we're on, the goddamn light behind me. Like, you're right. I'm surrounded by things I have. <laughs> like, how are we even food. talking right now? How are we even doing totally, this? dude. Uh, you're right. That is a great quote. But I'm that's probably going to use that. That's the great point, though, too, is that, like, this is why it goes back to what I mentioned before, this idea that we should be more open-minded, to your point as well, because, like, we don't even understand how the devices we're working right now, how we're using right now work. So, dude. you know, maybe there is more that's going on. And this is another thing that I've said, even the MH370 stuff is like, unless you think that we are at the pinnacle of science and technology and advancement right now, then we still have more to learn and more to go. And that means that some yeah. of what we thought is true before must be wrong to some degree. doesn't mean we have to throw everything out. Sure. But maybe there's some fundamental assumptions that we made, which aren't true anymore. And if that's true, then we should be people who are dreamers, people that are looking for what's the future going to look like in a hundred or a thousand years and what kind of technology yeah. can we really produce? So, Dude, I couldn't agree with you more, bro. It's like, get out of the cave. Let's go see what's over the hill. Yes. It's, it's, it's odd that we constantly have to like be reminded of that and remind people of that, especially in this field, you know, that I cover on bedded all the time. It's, it's, and maybe I was guilty of it even myself at the beginning a little bit, not being as open-minded. I'll, I'll admit that. Um, but yes, we, we have to start there first to listening and having the conversation and going there. I mean, I just shutting that down. And again, for me, anyone willing to do like actual things, boots on the ground, right? Like tr actually do something. Dude, I totally support it. I, I saw, you know, that brings me to a great point. And maybe I hope I didn't get this wrong, but were you hanging out with like Jeremy Riss, alien scientists and those guys or no? Yeah. So you probably saw the clip that I, I reposted related to that. Um, we did have a private uh, conversation that, that we didn't record um, between uh, there was a PhD physicist and uh, some of the engineers that, that Jeremy hangs out with. Um, and some of the people that I've, that I'm working with on uh, the, uh, the over unity device, device stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and we talked through the science with them and some concepts. And what I can Love say it. is that they, you know, some of J Jeremy was concerned that maybe I was getting scammed as well. Cause he's, he's a very skeptical minded guy, uh, sure. in general, especially when it comes to the science. And a lot of his concerns were alleviated after he uh, spoke with us. So I, I think that was a pretty good endorsement in general. Uh, I'm a big like fan Jeremy. of the APEC guys. Yeah. I'm a fan of those guys. Cause they're some of the only people who are actually trying to understand the science and the technology. That's what I'm saying. Right? They're like, actually doing stuff. They're like, like actually I, doing I, stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. And, I'm, you know, maybe I, it's I not all going to work or what have you, but I happen to think that a lot of it's going to end up working. But um, that's why I appreciate those guys a lot. And uh, that's why, you know, that was actually back in the MH370 stuff. That was probably the interview I was most worried about because I knew those guys were super smart. And I was like, <laughs> if anyone's going to be able to prove this science isn't real, it's going to be them. But they That's came funny. out of it and they're like, Jeremy's biggest thing was like, well, I think it might be cloaking and not teleportation. But other than that, like, I can't debunk any yeah. of the, the science that you see in the videos. So uh, I think that's a pretty good endorsement. I also would recommend that people check out like some of the APAC conversations, especially Tim Ventura's work. Like if people aren't Dude, familiar with Tim, that Ventura, guy's a great interviewer, yeah. by the way. He's great. His interviews are awesome. I would, I'm 1000%. The benefit there is like that. he, he talks to the engineers. Like that's why. I think people in, I guess it's called ufology. I call it ufology. But if people talk to more oh, engineers yeah. and no disrespect to experiencers, but ex everybody has experiences. And the thing about experiences is you can't like prove them scientifically, although they are absolutely meaningful. Don't get me wrong. 
Sure. But if you talk to the engineers that are working for the PMCs, and we're going to drop that acronym again, the private military <laughs> contractors, those are the people that know. Like, not only do they like know the science, but they have seen the crazy orbs and the other, you know, free energy devices and things like that. To me, those are the people that people should be talking to in general. And this is why I respect Dr. Greer, even though a lot of people don't like his CE5 stuff and what have you, is that he's talked to a lot of those engineers. Like I just posted all the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency papers, and I found all the names of the authors. They're all just available online. And when I'm looking through it, I'm seeing Hal Pudoff, Eric, uh, Eric uh, Davis, Davis has like yeah. four of the papers. He's got the one about extracting energy from the vacuum. And he's got the one about wormholes. And I'm like, okay. Um, Paul I just saw a video on, on him 10 years ago. Yeah. There was a, I should send you this video of Eric Davis, oh, 14 should. years old. It has 900 views. It's crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to send that to you. I don't think you, I bet you've never seen this video. Probably not. I haven't looked into enough of his stuff, but I'm, I think he's probably it was honest, wild, actually. bro. In fact, when I was watching, I was thinking of you. I was. I was Paul like, oh, size real quick. love this. I, I watched this clip that Dr. Greer had interviewed Paul Size. I had no idea who this guy was. And he's saying, well, he spent 30 years in the Air Force or 30 years in private military contractors, uh, 15 years, I think, in the Air Force with like eight at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is like the place where they think they test all the UFOs and stuff. And he spent like half his time in private military contractors and black projects. And he's just sitting here and this was like late 2000s or early 2000s. And he's talking about, yeah, we had craft that could go like 14,000 miles an hour. I'm like, what? How fast? <laughs> like, and he's just casually talking about casually talking about teleportation being possible. And then turns out he wrote one of those DIA papers. I'm like, I see his name. I'm going, oh, now I recognize his name. I'm like, oh, shit. I mean, people need to talk to the engineers, man. Like these guys know stuff. And. You're the world wrong. just like they get discredited. Eric Davis gets discredited. Hal Pudoff gets discredited. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence that people try to discredit these guys because I, I think that they just literally know a bunch of a bunch of crazy stuff. No, you're right, man. I I, I agree with all that. Um, yeah, that that dude, that is fascinating. Yeah. I'm I I've dude. Wow. Okay. I, wow. I've got a lot of homework to do now, Ashton, right? A lot to look into. I learned a lot, to be honest with you, as someone who, you know, comes at it very simply and just with a dumb chef mind, I've tried to understand some of this, um, but breaking it down just very simply for me. And I think a lot of the audience, because I'm sure a lot of the audience is going to, you know, they're, they're pseudo scientists and, and whatever. Great. Um, but I don't pretend to know things I don't. So, yeah, and I'll check out the I'm, chat when we you know. when this plays and uh, try to answer some questions. I would say the main thing, just to recap, the main points is that space is not empty. There is zero point energy yeah. out there. There's got to be a way to harness it. When it comes to the sure. first and second laws of thermodynamics, we don't really have to completely rewrite them, although I think at some point we will. Uh, we just have to open our system up. You open your system up and then you realize that you're extracting this energy from the environment. This allows us to get around the second law of thermodynamics, make our system non-equilibrium. We add that extra input. And then from the first law of thermodynamics, which would say energy can't be created or destroyed, you realize we're not creating it. We're borrowing it. We're, we're taking our little teaspoon and we're taking little teaspoons of energy out of the ocean, right? And so we're borrowing that energy and it's not going to have any appreciable impact on the overall. And if you think of it like that, then all of a sudden over unity becomes way more feasible. 100% like uh, absolutely I mean I I'm convinced honestly I'm just like I think it again I think it's the most promising sort of idea that I've heard out here um in the ether if you will <laughs> is, well I want to show is, you one day I think that'll idea. be fun so hell we'll yeah my much. reaction will be nuts uh for sure um I, I, I my mind will be blown there's no question um yeah I find this fascinating and it it has real world applications it could help yeah. real people Help exactly. real families, help real people. That's why not look into that. Oh, look how much other bullshit we research and develop all over the place for all kinds of things. Like, give me a break. We we shouldn't look into this. Get out of here. hundred percent agree. Some, man. You know what I mean? So yeah, dude. No, props to you. Respect to you. Again, I'll put links in the description to the three documentaries we mentioned. Of course, your, you know, your Twitter, your YouTube. Um, what other links should I put?
put in. If there's something else, send it to me and I'll add it to the, you know, no, that's great, that man. I think everybody out. should, if you watch people watch those documentaries, I think that'd be great. I did a few live streams that people can find where I go over some of that stuff. I actually watched, I think a couple of those documentaries on my live streams, uh, where oh, people want to learn more, they can check that out for sure. Um, okay, and then just cool. as a quick plug, I am planning on getting some, uh, MH370 clips made from some of my old stuff. Maybe I'll actually have them do some clips from our interview that we did as well. Uh, Dude. because, I mean, I'm not completely moving away from that, but like, you know, kind of dried up all the investigative research out there. So potentially going to have some of those clips coming out where some of them will talk about the science. Some of them will talk about the conspiracy angle and investigation. So be on the lookout for those over the next uh, few months as well, guys. And, dude, you know, you just thanks, Pat, fi for doing finance. This uh, oh, dude, always. You, you have an open invitation on the show, dude. You know, once a guest, always a guest. I really appreciate talking to you. I would say this, dude, you should make a documentary. I know it was some producer, do some, dude. I would watch the hell out of that. Like, if you put together a document, if anyone should, you would. You got a lot there to make something and tell your side of the story and what you. I think enough time is spent. You've done enough, right, to have something there and maybe end it on the free energy thing and what you're doing. And like that could be cool. That's the ending. Uh, thought, not man. to give it's ideas, but yeah, I mean, this is what I, I'm the idea, idea man. Okay, I'm the idea man, Asher. And I, that doesn't mean I can execute it. But I got ideas. <laughs> so, look, yes, this was awesome. Thank you again for coming on. Um, and just much appreciated, man. Thanks a lot, Pat. Love you, man. I live inside my own world of make-believe. Kids screaming in the cradles, profanities. I see the world through ice covered in ink and bleach. Cross. The ones who heard my cries and watched me weep